Welcome to the Seahawkers podcast with your host, Adam Emmert. It's unbelievable. I can't wait to never see Big Guns Hockey League ever again in my life. And Brandon Schultz. How is that unsportsmanlike even? To me, that seems overly sportsmanlike. That's extra sportsmanlike. Go Hawks! Welcome to Seahawkers Broadcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers, and joining me, Montana Seahawker Adam Emmer. Coming at you today, guys, with a second show, talking a little Eagles uh, as they come to the clink to take us on. It's a battle of the birds. And uh, I think they're feeling a little cockier than they ought to. I'm just going to put it to you that way. <laughs> well, we do have Scott Fenimore coming on in the show, and uh, he is a lifelong Eagles fan and a friend of ours that, that yeah. we've known from our time in Missoula. And uh, he went to the, the NFC Championship game with me against the Packers uh, back in 2014. So uh, we're going to bring him on and find out what he likes about the Eagles in this game. Yeah, I, and he wasn't cocky about it, but uh, I'm just saying, you know, Overall, Eagles fans. Especially for an Eagles fan. You know, I, I think Scott was maybe a little bit subdued uh, coming right. on today, you know, knowing the room. But it was uh, weird. I know yeah. Eagles fans are, are normally uh, very like much checking batteries at Santa. Yeah. Well, you know, like, <laughs> you know, trying to kill people. So, yeah. Well, to the, to, yeah. To the tune of the fact that you used to have a jail in the vet. Right. Like an actual jail. That's I know Scott, Scott was telling us about the uh, the that, judge that, that was was on site there. To uh, <laughs> He didn't even, it was like... Um, you didn't even have to go to court. Court was in the court stadium. Court was in the stadium. It's like the 7-Eleven yeah. of, of law enforcement. It was like they just had Judge Dredd sitting down there. He was the law, <laughs> you know? It's crazy. But yeah, the Eagles come in, the highly touted defense. I think that's interesting. Uh Rookie quarterback. I think that's going to be real interesting. And uh, it, it, this is an interesting matchup. I don't know, Brandon. I, I'm trying to hold back here a little bit because I think the Eagles aren't that good. I That's what I keep thinking. But then we see last week the Eagles get a 24 to 15 victory over mm-hmm. the Falcons. I mean, the Falcons right. are, are leading the, the NFC South. And I... I still don't think the Falcons are that good. Well... They're pretty good. I don't. I don't. I think they're better than 15 points, which makes me. It leads me to believe that 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 defense might be legit because you would think going into that game, Matt Ryan, Julio Jones, the issues that the Eagles have been having with their corners, that why couldn't Julio Jones just absolutely dominate that secondary, and Matt well, Ryan, one of the leading MVP candidates. Well, I think that's more of a statement towards the Atlanta offense than it is the Philly defense, uh, in my in my opinion. Because, look, Atlanta hasn't been the same light in the... I mean, we all remember Atlanta scorching the earth early in the season, but just like they have over the last couple of years, they start to wear down as the season goes on. They haven't been as explosive down the stretch. So the idea that you beat a so-so Atlanta team is fantastic. Good for you. And then really, the other thing that kept them in that 15 point range is that the Eagles ran the ball and really took care of time of possession and, and kept, uh, kept Atlanta off the field. It's tough to score points when you don't have the ball. It's all about the ball. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before. <laughs> I, I believe I have heard that, heard that phrase, but yeah, right. no, the, the Philly, Eagles did very well to keep the ball going on the ground. I mean, shoot, they had about 35 rushing attempts. So, and, and every guy outside of Wentz averaging more than five yards per carry. So, that's a good place to point to, but going into that game, they had they had yet to allow a quarterback to throw for more than 300 yards, and you kind of thought that Matt Ryan would be the guy to do it, especially with Julio Jones, Muhammad Sanu, um, and Julio does get his. He had 10 catches for 135 yards, but still, yeah. Matt Ryan, only 267 yards, and that was including a 76-yard touchdown pass to Taylor Gabriel. Well, and not only that, but they just what basically what they did was is they just saved that little record to be broken this year for Russell Wilson to break. Oh, that was nice because, of them. Yeah. Yeah, because you know it's gonna happen. Seattle ninth in the league passing the ball right now. And that's even through Russell Wilson's struggles earlier in the season when he, he, the, the knee injury and the ankle and the peck and everything. He's been lighting the earth on fire the last couple of weeks. I just don't see I just don't see the the Philadelphia defense having a prayer at stopping Russell Wilson in this game. 
I mean, I get that they, my one thing about the Eagles that concerns me is their defensive line. They do have a good defense. They have line. a Rams like defensive line. Well, sort of. Nobody has Br- uh, uh, Donald, but, no, but Fletcher the, Cox is a darn good player. Right. I, their interior uh, defenders are kind of scary to me. And then they have yeah, a good outside pass rushers. Yeah, but the, I equivocate the Philadelphia Eagles defensive line to the same as, say, Buffalo's defensive line. I think those two defensive lines are very similar. And you saw the Seahawks were able to handle it. I think they're better than Buffalo. I, I think that mm, the defensive line, I other, I think it's better than Miami and, uh, and not quite as good as the Rams. But because it is so close to that Rams defensive line in terms of how it's made up, that's what makes me think that this game's going to be close. Yeah, I don't think this game's going to be close at all. I just, th- those corners are terrible. No- Nolan Carroll might play. He's coming off concussion protocol. It sounds like, he, I don't know, it's 50 50. And you start putting, then he doesn't have anybody behind him. I mean, basically, you have uh, Jenkins back at safety, and he's a very good player. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. They're, the, but, the good part of their secondary is their safeties. Right. It's specifically Jenkins. Yeah. But, you start going, you know, Leotis McKelvin and the guys that are even below that on their depth chart when it comes to their corners, they're abysmal. Tyler Lockett is going to eat their lunch. Like, they, they, they have no shot. They have no shot at covering that. And when the Seahawks have been really clicked and locked in on the passing game, like they have the last couple of weeks since they've kind of turned Russell Wilson loose, they won't have a prayer. They don't have a prayer at covering those. Look, the Seahawks are going to score 30-odd some points, and the Eagles will not run the ball. They're not going to run the ball. In, there's no possible way. The Seahawks have been a very good run defense team all year long, and I cannot see the likes of Ryan Matthews tearing <laughs> us up. I'm sorry. He had one great game last week. Fantastic. First time in like the four years of his career. I've never been a Ryan Matthews fan. I think he's just a guy. Yeah, but they also have Darren Sproles, and he didn't play much. Or he didn't have very many carries in the last game. He only had two well, he's, carries. He's not a carries guy. That's not what Darren Sproles well, he's out does. of the backfield, you know, little tosses to him. And that's the one thing that does concern me about the right. Eagles offense. He is the one weapon I'm afraid of. Everybody else, please. Zach Ertz, captain injured? <laughs> I don't think so. Hey, who else do you have? Jordan Matthews? He might not even play because of back spasms. Yeah, wait, who you, and you have after that? Algalor? I don't even know how to say his name. Nelson Algalor? He, I mean, he's basically got the drops. And Doriel Green Beckham, who's a gigantic project. Man, this is, this is kind of a toothless offense. And I just, Wentz is going to have his hands full, man, in the clink against Cliff Averill and that pass rush, especially with their rookie right tackle out there. Cliff Averill could be have a, a big long game. day. No, but part of the thing that I worry about is just as you're kind of overlooking certain parts of this team, I worry about the Seahawks kind of overlooking this team because coming off a big win against the Patriots, riding high, coming in, coming back home to the safety of home where you're undefeated, and and we saw last year this team has the ability to get beat at home. And the other thing about Philly is they're a quick starting team. They tend to put points up on the board early. They tend to fizzle out toward the end of the game. But uh, so that could kind of favor the Seahawks because they do tend to come back. I I wouldn't be surprised if the Seahawks go into halftime uh, with a deficit. Uh, no, <laughs> that's not. It's just not. Here's happening. another thing that I look at with the with the defensive line. Looking at Pro Football Focus, the top four guys, uh, Aaron Donald number one for this is top four interior defenders. Mm-hmm. Aaron Donald number one. Calais Campbell, number two, and Dama okay. Sue, number three. Now, those wow. are all teams. L.A. You know, beat us. Arizona played us to a tie. Miami within three points. Number four on that list, Fletcher Cox with Philly. Just the way the Seahawks have played when they have that strong interior presence. They, they seem to struggle against teams like that. And then you have Brandon Graham on the outside, which was is the second rated uh, pass rusher of uh for in the league right now and number one if you look at pass rush uh, number two overall if you also consider rush defense so let me ask you a quick question how many quarters of play was russell wilson healthy facing those defensive tackles that you just rattled off now that's a good point two two quarters the very first two two quarters of the, of, of, of the entire of season. 12 yeah yeah 
Exactly. Russell Wilson is healthy again, man. They've decided to unleash him. And he's actually just ripping up the league right now. They finally are going ahead and taking the deep shots as well as the quick passing game. Because if you just sit and just throw the quick passing game all day, your corners are going to sit up on the receivers like they were doing. Now they know that Russell Wilson can protect himself to a degree. So now they're running a few bootlegs. Now they're running that, those secondary scramble plays, getting those big shots downfield. And you give, you make those corners for the Eagles cover a few extra seconds back there. Good night and good luck. Russell Wilson will torch them. Oh, and wait a second. Thomas Rawls is coming back this game. Thomas Rawls is coming back. And uh, Adam, this is, I, I did some calculations for you because I know we still, we still have this bet going on with the Rams podcast. Yes. Todd Gurley is averaging 57 yards per game. Okay. If he stays healthy and keeps that average, he gets to 915 yards. Mm-hmm. Doesn't break even a thousand yards playing an entire full season. Wow. Rawls has 25 yards right now. He's going to have to average 127 yards per game for the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. Can they do it? So you're saying there's a chance. (laughs) Yeah, I think I think there is a there's an idea that Thomas Rawls does have a shot at this. Is it an outside shot? Yeah, but listen to his press conference, man. The boy's fired up. He is ready to go. And I think he does feel physically better than he's felt in a very long time. And, you know, if there was a team to kind of get going against, I mean, the Eagles are only 13th in the league when it comes to stopping the run. This is, they have an opportunity to do it. Yeah. I ran down the list of all the rest of the teams that the Seahawks play in terms of their rushing average, the Eagles averaging, uh, giving up 101 yards on the ground bucks, one eighteen. the Panthers a little bit tougher, 79, uh, the Packers, but I, I don't know if we necessarily believe in, in that number at nope. 85. Uh, Rams giving up 103, the Cardinals 100, and the 49ers 180 yards. They're yeah. averaging that they're allowing. Yeah. That's they, 766. He has, a, he has a chance going down the stretch, man. It could happen. And you know Pete Carroll wants to establish that run game, too. So They do have uh, that, pro That could be fun, though. but it has to start this week, man. If they, if Basically, here, this is the long and short of this game. If the Seahawks stop the run and they run the ball, they win the game. Yeah. It, it's it's really that simple. Look, last time Carson Wentz uh, faced a defense that was, you know, of this caliber, uh, basically it was the Vikings. And he didn't have a great game. I think he threw two picks. You know, I mean, it's just 58% completion percentage. It wasn't a solid game. Here he is on the road against an even better defense than the Vikings. And he's going to have his struggles again, too. couple turnovers. You stop the run game, it's lights out. There are far more paths to victory for the Seahawks in this game than there are for the Eagles. They have to play a perfect, flawless game to win this game. Every everybody does. Well, going back, the the one thing that concerns me, Brandon, just the last thing I'll uh, put in there: uh, Eagles lead the league in time of possession, and that has been something that Mm. the Seahawks have struggled with. That's true. Well, going back to Rawls, Adam, uh, I did put in a text to our buddy Sam Marcou. Uh, Dolphins fan. Yes, yes. Because the Dolphins are playing the Rams this weekend. And I okay. said, maybe, just maybe, if Indomitian Sue could step on Todd Gurley and. Uh, <laughs> you're dirty. <laughs> oh, you're dirty, Brandon. It could, it oh, could give man. you a chance. So uh, Sam was going to put, he was. He said he was going to pass along the word to Indomitian on that. And, uh, okay. and so, and he said that he saw no reason why he wouldn't oblige. Well, there's that. I, I think it is in his nature. There's no doubt. But. Man, I can't root for Ralls or for Gurley to get hurt, man. Oh, you can't that's root terrible. for it, but if it happened, I'm well, just saying. Well, that would be good for my deal. Yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be sad, but I wouldn't be happy either. I mean, I don't I don't want him to get hurt. I didn't say hurt. I just said stepped on. Yeah, stepped on so he gets hurt. <laughs> I'm not advocating anybody get hurt, getting hurt. I just want <laughs> you right. to win. That thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, I speaking of guys winning, up. Adam. Bob Condotta of Seattle Times reporting George Fant locking up the Uh, starting left tackle job. Reports are Bradley Sowell will will compete with Gilliam for the right tackle spot. Yeah, I remember when Gilliam won the right tackle spot from the veteran Eric Winston who couldn't play anymore. Yeah. Remember when that happened? Yeah. And then Eric Winston's gone on to play solid years since then. Yeah. And now Gary Gilliam's in what? A competition? 
yeah. for his job that he wasn't even supposed to have this year. He's no, he was to supposed to be the left tackle. tackle. Yeah. I just don't, I don't trust these decisions, Brandon. I don't No, I'll look, I'm going to give fans some credit. He played a nice game for the most part. He's in, he improved. He's been improving every week. He, he played mistake, free, mistake free football. And the word coming out from the press conferences this week, he, uh, he, he made all of his targets. He didn't miss any. That's what I'm saying. He played a clean game. Yeah. So you got to give him credit for that. You do. Mm-hmm. And I, I said I was rooting for him. Okay, I good. just I just didn't think <laughs> that he has it in him yet. <laughs> this takes a while to learn how to play football. Otherwise, you'd pop out of the womb and strap it up for the NFL. I think that's you know? why people are so kind of rooting for this guy, though, because who does that? What kind of player comes into the league having not played, you know, barely a lick of college football? And now playing pro football at a position that is traditionally pretty hard. I don't know, but I would love to see another team take that gamble with their franchise quarterback. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I don't need, I don't need Russell Carrington Wilson getting killed because they, they want a feel good story at left tackle. I, I I'll pass on that hard pass. Thank you. Well, Kristen Michael cut this week from the team mm-hmm. uh, ends up getting picked up by green Bay uh, here's Coach Carroll in his press conference this week talking about what went into that move. Why was there why was there no place for Christian Michael in a supporting spot role or backup role? We're going with the other guys. Really, we, I already told you we're going with the guys that we wanted to go with. You know, and that's we're excited about where we're moving, and and uh, I think it's going to fit together really well. We'll find out. You know, you'll, you'll have your chance to say what you think here in, in a couple of weeks. We'll see how it goes. I like the way that Carol plays that at the end. You'll have, you'll have your chance to see what you think in a couple of weeks. Kind of like, I'm going to show you. I like it right at first where it's just basically an F you answer. No, we're just, we're just going with the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, now I think you had made a good comment on the ring of honor, Brandon, uh, that, uh, this could be the next Amon green for the, for the Packers. Maybe what wasn't Amon green, a guy that wouldn't switch uh, hands with the ball too. <laughs> and was, he was fumble prone or thought to be from fumble prone as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it was after he fumbled in a game that Mike Holmgren sent him packing. Yep. And uh and then he ended up having pretty good success over there. Yes, I, he did. I am rooting for him, but uh I think and I could see how it would be frustrating. You know, there were reports that came in that said that, you know, Kristen Michael kind of moping around a little bit on the on the sideline for the Patriots and and maybe not willing to necessarily accept being that uh in that role of kind of the the third guy. And so it it makes sense to send him to a place where um, it works out better for him. And then you get a guy like Troy main Pope that would be ecstatic to be in that role. You know, even if he doesn't make the the game day roster, you know, if he's a healthy scratch, you know, that dude is going to be fired up working his hardest week to week just for a chance. Yeah. There's a benefit to team chemistry there. No doubt. And not to say that Krista Michael is being a malcontent, but no. I mean, of course he's not going to be stoked. No, I mean like, he's a human being, so you can't blame him for that. But now he gets a shot in a situation where they could really use some good running. What I mean, I'm rooting for him, but I am definitely not rooting for him to like change the Packers season around. Like I'd like to see them ride the struggle bus for the rest of the season. That'd be fine by me. That'd be okay. Yeah. yeah. Before we get to our interview with Scott mm-hmm. Fenimore, one last transaction to get to. Silver Saliga released and defensive tackle John Jenkins brought in after he was cut from the Saints and kind of an interesting move considering that Saliga kind of, he seemed like he was playing pretty well. Well, he did seem like he was playing pretty well, but I'm pretty sure that Pete Carroll got frustrated with having to figure out how to say Silver (laughs) Saliga, whatever the hell his name, like however you say it, I think he was just over it. So he's like, I'll take John. I'm going to take, I'll take John. To play instead. That's much easier for my day. He got rid of one name that he couldn't say because he always said Christian. Yep. And uh, got, so he got rid of Michael and yep. Saliga. So no, uh, that's. <laughs> it's the name game. That's what this is all about. If you're going to play for the Seahawks, do not have an apostrophe in your first name. Don't have yeah. like any anything weird going on. You know what I mean? Like just. It, 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 you bad can't for your have, deal. Yeah. It's bad for your deal. You can't have like a bunch of vowels that run together. I mean. Just look at how many times they've released Tukawafu. They keep hoping he's going to change his name. <laughs> the surprising thing shouldn't be that they release Saliga because the Seahawks always looking at positions that they can get better. And you know, the word was is that 
that Jenkins wasn't really a scheme fit for the 4-3 defense that the Saints play. And another guy that you've seen the, Sa- the, the Seahawks bring in who wasn't seen as a, a scheme fit for the Browns was Ataba Rubin. So they see right. guys that maybe didn't necessarily fit in certain places, but could fit in the Seahawks scheme. And maybe, you know, with the low risk there for the for what Saliga brought. You know, they clearly knew what they had with him because he's been on the team before, went to New England. They brought him back. So he's, he's bounced around. Yeah, I mean, Saliga at this point in his career, he's a guy. He's just a guy. Uh, you know, replacement level guy. And I'm sure a nice person. I don't want to put him down or anything. But you, know, you think you can get that same thing out of Jenkins. And if not, maybe there's some upside there and you want to just give it yeah, a shot. Take a shot. I, it's Like you said, it's very, very low risk. There's, there's no doubt about that. Jenkins, a former third round draft pick. So, you know, you mentioned Ataba Rubin a little bit there. Yeah. And I've got, a, I've got a bone to pick with pro football focus, man, because I've been watching Ataba Rubin play this year and he's done his job really well. I think he's playing outstanding and I know it's hard to, you know, rate interior performers, but they've got him rated at 39.4 on their scale of one to one to a hundred overall, or just last week overall in the poor category. That's weird because I was looking at his individual game grades and he's been up and down. He's had games in the eighties and then games in the thirties. So I, who knows? Yeah, this is what I'm saying. So I think they need to reevaluate that a little bit. Oh, and they have Sherman listed as an average corner. Yeah, that makes no sense. That's that makes no sense. We they were our do better this week already. I I think we've. Uh, I said I had a bone to pick, not a do better. I know, but we've established yeah. that they have issues. That sometimes, yeah, it's hard to. You just gotta you gotta watch them. Like there's some things that I think they do a fairly decent job at, and others that. They just kind of fall flat a little. All right. Well, today we welcome on Scott Fenimore. He is a lifetime Philadelphia Eagles fan. And Scott, actually, he was, I don't know if this was your only game, Scott, uh, that you've been to at CenturyLink, but you actually came to the NFC Championship game against Green Bay with me. And uh, and so I know you were cheering on the Seahawks at one point, but uh, probably not going to happen this weekend. No, it will not be happening this weekend. And and I will say that that while that that trip to the NFC Championship game was definitely memorable, I was uh, there was a little bit of conflict in me in that uh, my family lives in in Wisconsin now. So and uh, many of my my friends here at home are uh, Packers fans. So uh, you know I was oh, getting. I, I wasn't supposed to say that you were cheering for the Seahawks. Shoot. Well, yeah, that's all right. That's all right. They all knew. They all knew. <laughs> Uh, I was getting texts throughout the game, of, uh, especially there as the, in the final seconds. They were cursing me for being at the game. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, it was kind of part of the deal, too, because I wouldn't have well, brought you if I would, exactly. if you would have been cheering I, for the Packers. Yes, I know that was that was the arrangement. So, <laughs> well, Scott, welcome to the show. And uh, yeah, we're going to be getting into talking some Philadelphia Eagles. Now, the Eagles five and four on the season. 4 and 0 at home but 1 and 4 on the road Scott. What's going on with the Eagles when they go on the road? Yeah, I don't know. Well, they've all been close games, so they've got that going for them. You know, I think Carson Wentz um he's been great at times. He's been somewhat lackluster at times. Hasn't really had a terrible game. I think this is all part of that learning experience for a rookie quarterback. The we had a little bit of, of trouble there on the offensive line. We've uh I think stabilize things in that regard. Wentz has done very well at the vet or at the vet <laughs> at the link. Um, but uh, outside of Philly, he, he does have some trouble. So Scott, let me start out by asking, you talked a little bit about uh, the Bakken bomber, Carson Wentz. <laughs> and that, that's, I, I want that to stick. I want bomb. that to stick. Yeah. The Bakken bomber. I think that's, I think that's his new nickname uh, being from North Dakota and all, but look, do you guys as an Eagles fan, do you feel like you found your, your franchise guy. I mean, do you, do you believe now? I mean, are you ready to go through these growing pains or do you look at him and go, man, I, I, I don't know if they've made the right choice or not yet. I, I think he's the future of the, of the franchise. I think he's our quarterback going forward. There's been a, a, a pretty dark period here uh, with the Eagles. Once Donovan McNabb left, we're kind of coming out of the wilderness. Um, he's got some really great leadership skills that he's demonstrated already with the team. Um, it, he's got the locker room and, you know, I think his play on the field has shown that, that he could really, you know, he could lead this team to a Super Bowl here in the next few years. 
I'm confident that we've we found our, our quarterback of the future. I, I will admit I was a little skeptical trading as many draft picks as we did, you know, losing all of our late round or second round picks, you know, in order to move up to get him. I think he's he's the one. All this talk about Dak Prescott and, and Dallas and, you know, I he's had a great season, but I, I'm not convinced he's as great a quarterback as everybody makes him out to be. I really do still think that, that Wentz is – probably the best quarterback out of that class and uh, is going to be the one that's going to lead the lead the Eagles for a long time. Have you, did you always feel that way or was there part of you uh, after, after the Eagles had traded away the draft picks Mm -hmm. once, once you knew that you had the second pick, was there any part of you rooting for the Rams to take Wentz so you would get Goff, or or were you hoping it would go the other way? <laughs> no, I, I I trust. I mean, it, you know, it's it is a difficult thing for for an Eagles fan to trust some of the front office leadership there with the Eagles, and you know, I think they they had their guy, and uh, Wentz was the one that they were after, and so you know, I figure we'll uh, we'll take that. You know, Goff may turn out to be a, a good quarterback, but I think Wentz is still the, the better of the two. I was, you know, from everything I had read leading up to the draft, seemed like a good kid. He's non-BCS conference quarterback. He'd had some success, but moving from that onto the NFL stage, um, he seemed to to take very well to it and uh, respond. Well, let's talk about one thing that I think is the strength of this Eagles team and and Scott, that's the the Eagles defense. They have looking at football outsiders, the Philadelphia Eagles have are number one in DVOA. And they're actually the they have the like, I think the worst record of a team to be number one in DVOA at this point of the season, which is kind of surprising. But they but they played a lot of close games. The defense keeps them in games. And and on top of that, they have uh, one of the top uh, sacking teams. So, so you have an outstanding pass rush, too. What's your confidence in that defensive line going into this game? Well, I think the line is phenomenal. Jim Schwartz has, has come in there and, and done a really good job with their defensive line and with the whole defensive side of the ball. The The thing that I'm always worried about are our corners. Uh, we, <laughs> our secondary is somewhat suspect. Um, we've got some some great guys at the safety position, but but our corners right now are haven't uh, shown great skill. And so going into this weekend, looking at you know Wilson, we'll see how things pan out. I think our, our, our front will get to him and make life very difficult for Russell, but um, we'll, uh, we'll see how it all goes. Scott, with all of the, you, you mentioned the corners being kind of a lackluster position group, you know, past <laughs> yeah. Bill and Carroll. <laughs> Uh, right. Out of the Seahawks weapons that they're matching up with, is there one Seahawk in particular that sticks out to you that is worrying to you considering those matchups? At the end of the day, I th- I think the whole receiving squad there on the on the Seahawks is going to be trouble for us. I'm not as worried about the tight end position. Um, I think we can we can handle that. Some of those outside those deep threat balls. That's what's going to be troublesome. I think going into the weekend. Well, let's talk about the Eagles receivers, Scott, because <laughs> I think you got to you have one one guy that I worry about as a Seahawks fan, Zach Ertz, because uh, when it, a good tight end against the Seahawks defense, uh, although we saw Gronk uh, kind of limited in the Patriots, but you still Martellus Bennett had a huge game. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Zach Ertz, I, I, I don't know how he's playing this year. Talk about him a little bit and how he compares with the, the, your other receivers. Well, they, there was sort of a, a, a glimmer of a strong relationship between Wentz and Ertz early in the season. And they had a, they hooked up on a couple of great plays. Ertz went out for a, a little while and hasn't seemed to quite get his step back. Um, he hasn't been a target for Wentz as much as I would like to see him. I think they do have the potential to be a really good tandem. You know, the the other receivers, you know, we got Jordan Matthews in the slot and, and he's a great receiver so far this season. But, you know, our guys on the outside, I mean, Nelson Aguilar and Doriel Green Beckham, I mean, <laughs> 
that's when you've got somebody who can throw the ball like Wentz and you've got those two guys on the outside, it's really disappointing <laughs> as a fan. You know, I mean, they've, you know, Aguilar, I think he, he I, there's flashes of, of greatness in there. I mean, I think, but, you know, he's, he struggled and, and I think the, the attention and the lights of the Philadelphia media and the Philadelphia fan base, you know, I don't know whether that's damaged his, his confidence or what, but, um, you know, he, I think could be a, a great receiver. He's only in his second year, you know, and I think, um, there could be a good future there. Doriel Green Beckham. I mean, he was, everybody was all excited about him in the preseason early on. And, you know, so far, not a whole lot. He has his flashes too, though. I, I see him, especially when he's matched up against smaller corners. He can just you know, run guys over when he when he looks like he wants to. He can do it, um, and you know he's been frustrated. I think of late that he hasn't get, gotten as many looks as as he'd like mm-hmm. to. Um, for that reason, I, mean, I think he he believes he can run over anybody and you know plow through. He's got the strength and power, but um, you know he, it's consistency. I think has really been the 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 issue with those receivers. One game that I've watched of the Eagles this year, Scott. And I, I know you had to be excited about this game was the, the game they played at home against the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings came into that game in Philly undefeated at five and zero, oh, and, and they were dominated the entire game. The, the Vikings scored in the, in the second quarter because they got two runs of seven yards or more. Mm-hmm. They had a 22 yard pass to Kyle Rudolph and, and Blair Walsh managed not to miss a 48 yard field goal. <laughs> and then, and then the, the Vikings, they don't score their touchdown until the last five minutes of the game. It still took the Vikings four minutes just to go 56 yards. And it's not like the Eagles defense wasn't trying. They, they strip sack Bradford twice on that drive <laughs> and, and they had first and goal from the, the 33 yard line and somehow managed to get a touchdown. But I look at that game and I, I must think, I mean, that is a, a dominant performance. Does that just stand out as how good this team can be in, in a particular game? Well, I think that's the potential of the team. I think Philadelphia fans, potentially more than others, take perverse pleasure in you know ruining a, a, a winning streak. Um, and I think that one was a pretty wonderful example of our ability to do that. Um, I mean, Minnesota hasn't even hasn't recovered from that game, and uh, it was just impressive. I mean, I think you know the keys in there was the fact that the line got to Bradford as often as they did. Um, they just disrupted his rhythm. And, you know, it uh, it worked out. So, Scott, one last thing that I kind of wanted to touch on. One of the Seahawks greatest strength is their pass rush. It's been something that's really been uh, one of the best in the league this year. Tell me a little bit about the Philadelphia offensive line, because I, I know about Jason Peters, of course, and, and Wisniewski. But it was, tell me a little bit about the right side of your guys' offensive <laughs> line, whether that's Brooks or, or Bataille or whatever the heck his name is. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we had a little issue this year. Lane Johnson had his second PED violation, and so he's serving on a 10-game suspension. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they brought in, you know, our, our rookie, um, Vitae, who his first game, he he got just run over. I mean, he, the poor guy just couldn't fulfill his assignments. But, you know, I've been impressed. The last couple of games, he has shown – much better ability in understanding what his role is and fulfilling it. They haven't had to move extra help over, you know, and putting a pulling in another tight end to help, you know? So I think, I mean, our offensive line actually is quite possibly one of the better offensive lines in the league right now. Um, they're working well together. They're protecting Wentz and, uh, and then open up holes for those running backs. I mean, I think last game, Ryan Matthews um, had the, what, I mean, was probably one of the, the better um, running back performances from the Eagles, really, since we lost LaShawn McCoy. It's, uh, again, I think a pretty good sign for, for things to come and I think could, could really be a, a benefit to the team this weekend. And uh, they'll, they'll cause some problems for your Seahawks. Yeah, you're not joking about Ryan Matthews, too. Pro Football Focus had him rated as the the top running back of in the entire league based on his performance last week. So 108 yards on 19 carries and 
Uh, one thing they point out, 47 of those 108 yards coming after initial contact. I mean, it's, it was uh, an impressive performance. I think, you know, I tend to, to look more toward Darren Sproles. I just think he's a, a, an amazing talent and uh, can do just about everything out of the backfield. Yeah. Um, and uh, you don't want to but, punt to um, that guy either. That's for sure. No, you don't want to punt to him. Well, we'd like you to punt to him, <laughs> but <that's, laughs> uh, it's. Uh, you know, the I don't always like the the running back by committee approach, but it seemed to work um, to some extent for the Eagles this year. OK, Scott. Well, bottom line, break it down. How how is this game going to turn out? I think it'll be a close game. I got to say that the Eagles are probably are, are going to pull it off. Wentz will will get a, a, a victory on the road and uh, we'll. Uh, uh, have you guys eaten crow next week? So <laughs> you're going to call a score on us too, Scott? <laughs> um, thinking around probably like 21, 17. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's incorrect. <laughs> Very good. Adam. Uh, just based off of the performances we've seen from the Eagles on the road this year, they, they always seem to hang in uh, close uh, with all their opponents. So, um, I don't know. Best of luck, I guess, this weekend. Yeah, uh, well, same to you good guys. Good injury luck. Again. Let's just, we'll <laughs> right. just wish him good yeah, injury Good injury luck. luck. Yeah, yeah. So, well, one thing I will say is that, you know, as a um, lifelong Eagles fan, I did, um, you know, when when the Seahawks were, were part of the AFC and um, – Growing up, that the, the Seahawks were my AFC team, and then on top of that, um, Cortez Kennedy was probably one of my favorite players, especially after uh, Jerome Brown, who was a Philadelphia Eagle, um, died tragically in a car accident. They were teammates at Miami together, and um, so I actually had a Cortez Kennedy Seahawks jersey as a kid. <laughs> so oh, wow. uh, you know, it. Uh, I, I've always had somewhat of a soft spot for the for the Seahawks, but uh, you know, not this weekend. So. <laughs> Well, Scott, I appreciate you coming on, talking about your Eagles. And uh, yeah, we will, uh, I don't know, hope to see you in the playoffs, maybe. Yeah, no, well, it could be, could be. So we'll see. We got, uh, we got to work that out for us. But uh, with a resurgent NFC East, um, it'll be, it'll be interesting going through into, into January. And we are back getting into the rest of the show. Going to be a little bit shorter than a normal show, but this is our second show of the week, Adam. I kind of like the format of separating the game review and then the next game's preview. Mm. I, I'm kind of enjoying that. Now, it is a lot more work, but I think I'm, I'm warming up to the idea. Okay. There might be ways that I could be persuaded to to do this going forward. <laughs> Let's put it that way. All right. Well, speaking of that, we have a new member of the flock. Uh, welcome to James Paul. Oh, right on. Thanks, James. Kind of a short list, but again, a short week. It hasn't, uh, right. bits since our last show, but, uh, yeah, yeah. just a couple of days. So yeah, but James got in there, so welcome we didn't have a, an offer. I know. <laughs> appreciate that, man. Always See, good. It's people like James who comes through even on a short week. It makes me consider doing two of these a week. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of people coming through where people really came through this week is with reviews, Adam. Five reviews. Really? Let's get into Holy them. Crap. And yeah, how did that happen? Thank okay. the folks that, that brought in reviews this week. Uh, here's one from AK Rhino. This is a five star podcast. Uh, the Seahawkers podcast is a five star podcast for sure. But last week they had a three star review and we beat the Patriots. So I'm just trying <laughs> to do my part here. If you love the Hawks, you will probably love this podcast. Go Hawks. Oh, Hawks. Thanks, man. I think the three star review is the best thing for us because people are clearly responding. Uh, oh, having somebody give us like a legitimate three star review? Yeah, <laughs> yeah got, they got more angry about it than I think either of us did, <laughs> which is great. That's I great. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Here's 12th Man Review from Film Core in Canada. It says, I can't believe this is stuck on 11 ratings. Seahawks fans do better. I had this on my old phone until that died and I lost touch with it. I found it again and was enjoying it until iTunes inexplicably deleted it from my feed. Now it's back to stay. 
great hearing your perspective on the best team in the league and the feedback from other fans. You guys have a great dynamic. Not often I laugh out loud while driving. Go Hawks. <laughs> Thanks, man. That's uh, that's sweet. Oh, wait. He must be on like Stitcher or something like that. No, he's on he's uh, the Canadian iTunes. So Oh, and we only have 11 in yeah. the Canadian. Well, we're up to well, 12, 12 now, right? thanks to him, yeah. All right, man. That's awesome. Here's one from Seattle Ray Seahawks fans. Look no further. Adam and Brandon have done it and are doing it on a weekly basis. These guys are not just football fans, they are informed spectators that are helping you, me and the collective us be better fans of our team. They do it all in a humorous way and an informed way. Not strictly a homer. Our team is the best regardless of reality and the record way. Listen, laugh, and learn. Yay football. Yay Hawks. <laughs> I like that. They took a little uh, picks and IPAs uh, yeah. ending to that. I like that. I do. Yeah. I like that too. Oh, and to the the dude in Canada too. If you're having issues with your feed getting deleted too, you can go to to seahawkerspodcast.com slash iOS if you have an iPhone. And uh, so seahawkerspodcast.com slash iOS, you can get our iPhone app. And uh, then you free? don't, yeah, for free. And you don't have to worry about uh, any kind of issues with your feeds. That we our, won't delete our own app off your phone. I promise. We promise. Holy catfish. These guys are good. Keep up the good work, fellas. I make listening part of my Wednesday night routine. Cheers from a fellow military Seahawker. Oh, thanks, man. I guess another reason why we have to make sure to have these out by Wednesday. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. I don't want to disappoint if it's part of somebody's routine, especially a military man. I know how you guys are about routines, so I, I don't want to screw that up. That's true. That's important. Yeah. That one's from B guard drag B. I, that's an interesting username. I was thinking the same thing. The usernames are hilarious, man. I like them. Here's one that's easier for me from David C. 35. 12s rejoice. The best pod for some good old Seahawks bias. I can finally get away from the NFL media. Always on the latest bandwagon. Great show, guys. Go Hawks. That's right, man. There will be only one bandwagon on the Seahawkers podcast, and it'll be driven by Russell Carrington Wilson. So you have no worries there. And and yes, I think it's okay for us to have a bias. You know, this is the Seahawkers uh, booster right. club. It's the booster club for the team. Yeah. So we kind of it's kind of our duty to be biased a little bit toward toward the Seahawks. Well, some people say bias. I'm saying that we just take the little team that's in southern Alaska and give it the shine that it was supposed to have in the <laughs> national media that it doesn't get. Some people might call that bias. See, I just think that that's fair because the way the media talks about the stupid Patriots, stupid Packers, the Cowboys, the Cowboys, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm over it. Like, finally, we are speaking up for you guys, man, because that's dumb. We, we should have at least the same amount. It is true. Well, uh, thanks to everybody for their reviews. And what do you say we get into a, a do better and the better at life to close out the show, Adam? Okay, since uh, we didn't have a lot of time to prep, uh, you have a better at life and I have a do better. But one last thing before we get to that, Brandon, with the reviews, we appreciate it because it gets us up in the rankings in iTunes. What has been brought to my attention more recently, what really shoots us up, apparently, is when you hit the subscribe button. Mm, mm -hmm. I don't know why iTunes has such a big deal about that. Because you think if somebody was like, this thing's awesome, they would put that like up in, you know, higher. Yeah. No, no, no. You actually have to hit subscribe. So if you haven't done it for whatever reason, hit the button. It's going to be better for you. Yeah, definitely best to always uh, get the shows as they come in. If you're if you're going to the website week to week and, and just trying to remember that way. No, you want it coming to your phone on a weekly basis. So subscribe in iTunes, download our app. Uh, if you have a, an Android phone, you can go to SeahawkersPodcast.com slash Android and, and get our app there. And uh, I keep thinking that we have a Windows phone app coming, but uh, I'll let you know as soon as that happens. <laughs> well, for the for the fives of people that have a Windows phone. I know, but we are like Seattle is like Microsoft town. And I, I keep I telling that. folks that uh, uh, there there may be a greater proportion of Windows phone users in okay. Seattle than anywhere else. So that makes sense. I, I got you. All right. Well, before you get to your do better, though, I, I feel like I should honorary do better myself. Uh, I Oh, yeah. I, I noticed that uh, one like of our listeners. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. One of our listeners got uh, the stickers that I had sent out mm -hmm. and I was not paying attention to the stamps. Uh, and the, the photo that was pointed out to me, it was the it was winter songbirds uh, was yeah. the was the stamps. Okay, That's what Costco had. Yeah. One of those stamps. 
fish. Cardinal Adam. Oh, no. <laughs> I, sent out, yeah. I sent out some of the envelopes with cardinals on them. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> That's bad news, man. Yeah, you need a little do better in your life on that one. Yeah. Oh, man. I think that was ah, Mark Costco Law that pointed you. that out. Yeah. Costco got you. They got yeah, me. The, oh. All right. Who's your do better this week? Okay. my You were mentioning Microsoft earlier, so it actually has something to do with technology. My do better this week, Brandon, is for automatic updates. I am sick of automatic updates. They're the bane of my existence. They're the bane of the, my existence on my tablet on my phone, and on my computer. Let's just take today, for example. I try to get on the Skype with you. I try to open up Skype. First, it freezes. Fine. Force quit. It closes. Open it back up. Just as I'm answering your call for the second time, the whole thing shuts down again because, wait one moment, we're updating your Skype. I don't want you to freaking update my Skype. I'm trying to do catfish right now, okay? I don't need this. I don't need this. Yesterday, my phone was out of commission for two hours because it had to run some random update that I didn't even want because now I have to have two code authentication or some bullshit. Catfish! That doesn't matter. Like, I got an idea. All my stuff works. Let's leave it the hell alone. And when it stops working, then I'll ask you for an update. But until then, quit wasting the hard drive space on all my devices, quit wasting my time, and quit wasting everybody's just sanity Every time I got to refigure out the device I just figured out. You guys who write automatic updates do better. Yeah, the There's one no thing, choice. The one That's thing that I, I hate worse than automatic updates is when you have uh, the review pop up for a particular app and says, do you love this app? <laughs> no, I don't. Right. I don't love it. I mean, it's OK. <laughs> how do you lead? You, you ask leading questions in your in your rating like that. How biased is that? Right. I know. Yeah. And that's it. It's so, just uh, you- on a scale of one to catfish. Awesome. Like how catfish. Awesome. Are we? <laughs> that would at least uh, give you a scale to like, I just have a yes or no question. And do I love right. it? <laughs> no, I don't. Eh, I tend I to like reserve. I tend to reserve yeah. my love for things that I love <laughs> and, yeah, like, and apps generally. Don't rate that highly. No, like your family or Tanner McAvoy. Right. You know, things that you reserve your love. Important for. things. Yeah, exactly. Well, speaking of things we reserve our love for, my better at life okay. this week, Thomas Rawls, Adam, because he is back. And man, dude could not be any more happy and genuine and just fired up to play this week. And it was interesting. I I have a couple clips from his press conference because he was so, and I would recommend any, normally I would not recommend a press conference for (laughs) anybody to watch, but Thomas Rawls, man, his, his attitude in this press conference was infectious. And he had a lot of good comments, including this one, uh, just talking about how impactful his family has been going into this week. This whole week, my father, uh, my brother, uh, and a lot of my family members, they've been texting me the same message lately. Relax. Breathe. It's okay. (laughs) It's okay. Because they know the type of person I am. And I'm a real passionate person. Play with a lot of drive. I live my life like that. And I'll I'll never change it. But but that just shows the support, you know, from, from, from close friends, family, and people who really care about me genuinely. So I want to thank them also for that. So Thomas Rawls is a really intense guy. I mean, that's something. And I've been trying to figure out what about him. Like, who does he remind me of? And then I figured it out. Thomas Rawls is the goofy version of Earl Thomas. (laughs) That's who he is. They're the same guy. Just Thomas Rawls is goofy. Yeah, I I can kind of see that. Well, Earl's is goofy in his own way, too. Yeah, no, but Earl is more like. Like kooky goofy. (laughs) Kooky, yeah. Like, just a little off sometimes, you know? Like, in, in Rawls is just like, you know, he's a, he's just a goofball, man. Like he's, he's just grinning and, uh, he just says things like in, just in an odd way, but just all comes from exuberance, you know? Yeah. He's a, he's a goofball, man. Well, and the other thing that I took away is that one, he loves physical plays and yes. two, he's always, uh, looking to give guys, you know, his teammates some credit, particularly this last game with mm-hmm. CJ Procise. I'm going to tell you what play really had me fired up. And I know y'all seen it. He caught the ball. He ran He ran toward the sideline and got physical and dropped his shoulder on the defender. 
that is what bring the energy here. That 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 physical style, that exciting feeling, that because I'm gonna tell you, because when I did it, I knew what it felt like, and I know what it meant to him. And before that game, we had a talk, and I was. I can't tell you what the talk was, but I, I can tell you I'm proud of him. And he he played he played fantastic. Um, the other backs did also. And um, one thing about Pro Size, he very versatile. As you can see, he can line up outside, run the ball in the backfield. He just he just in a real explosive weapon that we can use in his offense. So I'm very excited about. It. I'm glad he's on this team. I love the way that ends. I'm glad he's on this team. <laughs> and I and I wonder about the talk, right? Because I think this is a talk that Marshawn had with with Rawls. Yeah, I think Rawls is having with Pro Size, and it's. We don't go out of bounds. We knock people on their ass. Yeah. And there's a reason. Because that's how many times we talked about this in the last pod, Brandon, where Marshawn would light somebody up and the sideline erupts. And that energy becomes infectious. And Thomas Rawls understands that completely. You could hear it in his voice, the passion about how he truly felt about that play and how excited he was. That's not made up. Right. So I look for him to knock a couple people on their ass today or on Sunday. I think that's happening. Like I, I'm feeling feel pretty good about Thomas Rawls coming into this. I am feeling good about him too, and that is why this week, Adam, he is better at life than Skip Bayless. I agree, man. Good choice. Well, guys, I hope everybody enjoyed getting two shows this week. Uh, let us know what you guys think. Do, yeah. do you like the format? Would you would you continue just to go with the once a week show? How does it fit into your routine? Can you make right. it work? Yeah, I mean, because if we're screwing up your deal, like, let us know. I, we don't want to do that. I mean, we're lucky enough to be a part of your lives. But do want to thank everybody who does listen. We've had tremendous growth here just in the last uh, you know, couple months. It's really amazing. So keep getting the word out to your friends and family, people who love the Hawks. Uh, get them on board. Have them listening. And uh, be sure to get in the flock and donate on Patreon. And, uh, you know, just be an awesome twelve. Get Getintheflock.com is where you can go for that, Adam. And with that, I think there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Thanks for tuning in to this week's show. As we mentioned, if you want to help support the show, you can go to getintheflock.com. But there's other ways to support the show, too. You can go to seahawkerspodcast.com slash support. If you're going to a away game and want tickets, you can go there. There's plenty of other things. Or if you're looking for that next Seahawks jersey, go to Fanatics and uh, you can click on our link at SeahawkersPodcast.com slash support. Get your gear through there and uh, a little percentage kicks back to the show. You bet, man. That's again, you're doing it anyways. So hook a brother up. I don't know. That's too much. Yes. SeahawkersPodcast.com slash support. Thanks again for supporting the show.